Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the Canadian Liver Foundation and the University Health Network Ashmere Transplant Center Core webinar series on liver disease and liver transplantation. My name is Nan Maximovich, and I will be the moderator and host for today's webinar. I'd like to start by acknowledging that the Canadian Liver Foundation's national office in Markham, Ontario, is situated upon traditional territories of the Anishinaabe peoples and of the Haudenosaunee peoples covered by the Upper Canada Treaties. The Ashmere Transplant Centre and the Centre for Living Organ Donation at UHN are located in Toronto, traditional territory of Mississauga's Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples in our home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. Toronto is covered by the Treaty 13 signed the Mississauga for the Credit, and the Williams Treaty signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. This is the first session of the 2023 quarterly series. Uh, in this first session, our speakers will talk about alcohol and alcohol liver damage, alcohol associated, alcohol related liver disease, along with understanding the process of liver transplantation for people with alcohol associated liver disease and learning more about available resources for those who are living with alcohol use disorders. We are joined tonight by our two presenters. We have Dr. Jennifer Fleming from the Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, and Dr. Jose Lynch from the University Health Network in Toronto, Ontario. As for our agenda today, we will have both our speakers complete their talks prior to moving on to a question and answer portion. So please feel free to use the comment feed and the Facebook question feed uh, to ask your questions during the presentation. And note that questions will be answered following both speakers' talks. This webinar will be available post-event on the Canadian Liver Foundation and UHN website, along with the CLF and Center for Living Organ Donation Facebook and YouTube channels in the coming days. Briefly, uh, for those who may not be familiar with the CLF, I'd like to provide you with a brief overview of who we are, what we do. Uh, we were established in 1969, and we're the first organization in the world created to help people with liver disease. We are committed to promoting liver health and improving the prevention diagnosis and treatment of liver disease through our core pillars of research, education, patient support, and advocacy. Our partners at the Center for Living Organ Donation were established by UHN Transplants, now the Ashmere Transplant Center in 2018. Its mission is to improve access to living liver and living kidney donations and transplantation. The Ashmere Transplant Center is Canada's largest transplant center and UHN's Toronto General Hospital is ranked among the top five hospitals in the world. At this time, I'd like to welcome our first speaker, Dr. Jennifer Fleming. Dr. Fleming is an associate professor of medicine and public health science at Queen's University with clinical training in gastroenterology, hepatology, and liver transplantation. After completing her internal medicine and gastroenterology training at Queen's University, she completed two years of advanced hepatology and a master's in clinical research at the University of California, San Francisco. She's a clinician scientist who leads a research program which leverages Ontario's administrative data to evaluate the epidemiology and outcomes of patients with cirrhosis. I will now hand it over to Dr. Fleming for tonight's session. Great, thanks, Nem. And I wanted to thank the audience for um, being here today and participating in this session. So what I'm hoping to do over the next 15 minutes or so is I'm hoping that the audience will understand the amount of alcohol, which can lead to alcohol associated liver disease. We'll review the different types of alcohol associated liver disease because there's not just one. We'll then go on to appreciate how alcohol associated liver disease progresses. And then finally, we'll recognize reasons why individuals with alcohol associated liver disease might need a liver transplant. So alcohol causes many adverse health effects and high levels of alcohol use is a leading cause of death and disability around the world. Worldwide, alcohol is responsible for over 3 million deaths per year. And importantly, it is the leading cause of death and disability in those aged 15 to 49 years. The liver is the most common organ which is damaged by alcohol use, but it's also important to recognize that the alcohol can affect not just the liver, but multiple different organs in the body. So what amount of alcohol use puts a person at risk for alcohol-associated liver disease? 
The term that's generally used if you're uh, reading different resources is, is high risk drinking. And well, what do we mean by high risk drinking? High risk drinking is different between men and women because there's differences in the way that men and women metabolize alcohol due to different levels of specific enzymes that are required to break down alcohol, as well as the influence of different sex hormones such as estrogen on the liver. So an individual is thought to be at risk of alcohol associated liver disease. If you are a man and you are drinking more than 15 drinks per week or on average more than three drinks per day. Conversely among women, high risk drinking is considered among women who drink more than 10 drinks per week or more than two drinks in one day. So the next question is, well, what is a drink? So there's actually a definition of what constitutes a standard drink and one standard drink refers to 10 grams of alcohol, at least in Canada and in Europe, that's uh, 10 grams is what's considered a standard drink. If you're reading um, different resources from the United States, they consider 14 grams of alcohol a standard drink. So when we're trying to quantify somebody's alcohol use in order to figure out if they're at risk of alcohol associated liver disease, there's different ways that we ask these questions to try and quantify it because most people aren't going to say, oh, I drank 40 grams of alcohol last night. So this is a chart that we use as a reference. So you can see here that even though, so one standard drink is 10 grams of alcohol, which is a half a pint of beer, one uh, and a half ounces of spirit or a small glass of wine. Other ways that we quantify that, uh, particularly when we're talking about wine, is that everybody's glass size is different, but within one bottle of wine, there is uh, on average about eight different drinks. So these are different resources that you can use if you want to try and quantify your own alcohol consumption. So currently Canada's low risk drinking guidelines relate to the amount of alcohol, which uh, puts people at risk of alcohol associated liver disease, as we just talked about, that's different between men and women. Many of you may have heard recently in the media that Canada is going to update its low risk drinking guidelines. And currently the proposal is for men and women to consume no more than two standard drinks per week. So that is a lot less than previously had been recommended. And this is because bad health outcomes, so outcomes that aren't just related to liver disease, so there's many other organs that can be affected, can occur at levels of alcohol higher than two drinks per week, which is why this update um, is uh, being suggested. So how many Canadians are actually at risk of alcohol associated liver disease? These are estimates from um, surveys that are taken from Canadians across the country. And within the past year, having any alcohol use was very common, occurring in about 78% of the Canadian population. But when we look to see who's at risk of alcohol associated liver disease, it is 20%. So 20% or one in five individuals in Canada are at risk of alcohol associated liver disease. But we all know that not everyone who consumes heavy amounts of alcohol will develop alcohol associated liver disease. So this is a very important point that the amount of alcohol consumed is not the only factor that will explain why somebody will develop alcohol associated liver disease. So in this slide, I'm going to go over other things that can increase the chance of somebody developing alcohol associated liver disease. Some of these things are uh, potentially modifiable or modifiable or individuals might be able to change and some of these are fixed and we're not able to change them. So the factors that we're not able to change are being female. As I mentioned, females are at higher risk of alcohol associated liver disease at lower levels. We also know that different uh, racial ethnic groups as well as cultural difference can increase the risk of alcohol associated liver disease, as well as a family history of liver disease and certain genetic um, uh, features of individuals can make the risk higher. These things, unfortunately, we're not able to change. There are, however, different modifiable factors that have uh, been associated with alcohol-associated liver disease. The first thing is binge drinking. So if individuals consume the majority of their alcohol all in one sitting, that increases your risk of developing liver disease. Further, in individuals who consume spirits or hard liquor or beer as opposed to wine. 
Individuals who consume alcohol on a daily basis, as opposed to taking non-drinking days, will have a higher risk of alcohol-associated liver disease. It's been well shown that individuals who consume uh, low levels of coffee drinking, so that's less than one cup a day, are at higher risk of developing liver disease. And further, people who consume alcohol outside of meal times are also at increased risk. So these five different things are potentially things that you might be able to modify if you're concerned about developing alcohol-associated liver disease. So how does alcohol actually damage the liver? So heavy levels of alcohol use leads to increased fat buildup in the liver. And as we mentioned, not in everybody, but in some individuals who consume the heavy amounts of alcohol, this fat can cause liver inflammation as well as scarring, which leads to liver damage. So there's a spectrum of alcohol associated liver disease. It can go from mild where people have fat in the liver, but they don't have symptoms and there's no long-term damage. In some individuals, this might be moderate where there aren't any symptoms, but liver damage can occur that might be reversible. And some individuals unfortunately develop severe alcohol associated liver disease when symptoms may occur and or liver failure. So over the next several slides, I like to use car analogies when I'm trying to explain this um, to patients. And I think that it really helps them understand um, what the different stages of alcohol associated liver disease are. So this would be mild alcohol associated liver disease. So here's a car and there's a scratch on it. So in mild disease, which we call alcohol associated hepatic steatosis, what that means is there's just some fat buildup in the liver, but really there's no long-term damage if there's only fat. And if you are able to become abstinent from alcohol, then this fat can go away and the car is still functioning normally. In somebody who has moderate alcohol-associated liver disease, we call that alcohol-associated steatohepatitis. And what that means is that there's fat buildup in the liver, but there's also inflammation and scarring. So it's a more severe injury. So in this car, there's a big dent in the car from all the inflammation and scarring from the alcohol. But with uh, alcohol abstinence, we can fix this car. And even though the car is damaged, it's still functioning. So there's no liver failure, but there is some damage to the car. A more severe injury, we would call alcohol-associated cirrhosis. And what that means is that there are, over time, there's been lots of buildup of scar tissue in the liver from all the inflammation from the fat. And this happens chronically over long term. So years and years of buildup of scar tissue. Even though somebody has cirrhosis, the car might still be able to function. It might be able to still drive on the road. But we know because there's so much scar tissue that's built up that it's at high risk of the car breaking down. And at some point in time, we may need to trade this old car in for a new one. The most severe form of alcohol associated liver disease we call acute alcoholic hepatitis. And that is when there is a very, very significant amount of inflammation that is in the liver and it happens very suddenly. And it's kind of like your liver is in a car crash. And when this happens, the car starts to not function and we might be able to fix the car, but we might actually need to trade it in for a new one. So I'm gonna use a different set of pictures here to truly try and hone in this point. So what actually happens in alcohol associated liver disease? So we're going to start with the moderate um, injury. So this is the car with the big dent on the side, the alcohol associated steatohepatitis where we have fat, inflammation, as well as scarring. So in individuals who continue to consume alcohol, there's buildup of scar tissue in the liver that occurs over years to decades. And in many people, there's no symptoms and they may not know that this is actually happening. In a, a proportion of people where this is happening, they will develop what we call compensated cirrhosis. And when we use that term, it means that there's a lot of scar tissue in the liver, but the liver is actually functioning normally. So even though we know it's at risk of breaking down, the liver is continuing to function. However, if you have compensated cirrhosis and there's ongoing alcohol exposure, at some point in time, people will develop what we call decompensated cirrhosis. And that's when individuals develop symptoms or complications from liver failure. So things that patients might experience would be bleeding, usually from esophageal or gastric varices. There can be buildup of fluid in the belly as well as the legs and sometimes in the lungs. We call that fluidocytes. 
There can be confusion that uh, occurs because of toxins that are building up in the body because the liver's not able to filter out all those toxins. We call that encephalopathy. People may also develop liver cancer and kidney failure is also a worrisome sign in people who have decompensated cirrhosis. Once you develop decompensated cirrhosis and these complications, that's really when individuals are at risk of dying from liver disease. I also want to highlight acute alcoholic hepatitis. So that was the big car crash. So that's when there's a lot of inflammation in the liver that occurs in a very short period of time. And this can actually happen in people, even if they don't have underlying cirrhosis, they might still develop the complications of liver failure that put them at risk of dying. So how do we know when somebody's at risk of dying from liver failure? This is when we use the MELD score. This may be something that you've heard uh, uh, discussed online or talked to your care providers about. This score, we use four different blood tests to calculate a score, and it allows us to estimate how likely somebody is to die from underlying liver disease. And it's when these complications of cirrhosis develop that we start to think about whether or not we need to do liver transplant. I would also like to highlight that alcohol abstinence is very, very important when somebody develops alcohol-associated liver disease. And even in those individuals who have decompensated cirrhosis, if you are able to achieve alcohol abstinence, and it can take a while, sometimes between six and 12 months, the function of the liver can get better. And in certain individuals who have developed decompensated cirrhosis, if they are able to maintain abstinence, some individuals will go from having decompensated cirrhosis back to having compensated cirrhosis, where the need for liver transplant is lower and we can um, have resolution of the alcoholic hepatitis. So in this last slide, I'm going to be discussing some of the reasons why somebody with alcohol-associated liver disease might be considered for transplant and reasons why someone might not be considered for transplant. And all the details of these criteria can be found on the Trillium Gift of uh, Life Network uh, website, which I've referenced down below. So one of the main reasons why somebody might be considered for transplant is if their MELD score is higher than 15, despite all our best efforts to treat the underlying liver disease and maintain alcohol abstinence. And that's based on this graph down here. So on the bottom part here are the numbers of the MELD score. So it goes from six up to 40. And over here is the three month uh, percentage of individuals who will be alive. So we can see here when the MELD level is 15, if you're below this, there's very few people who are going to be dying from their liver disease. And so the risks of undergoing a large transplant procedure are not likely outweighed by the benefits. However, once the MELD score gets past 15, you can see that people start to die from their liver disease. And this is when we think that the risks of undergoing a large surgery like a transplant uh, may be more beneficial than somebody continuing to live with their own liver. Other reasons why we might think about transplant would be if individuals have developed liver cancer, which we call a pedicellular carcinoma or HCC. And decisions regarding transplant for liver cancer are based on the number, size, and location of the tumors, as well as tumor marker levels and response to cancer treatment. And finally, there's other more rare reasons why we might think about transplant. For example, some individuals develop lung disease, which is caused by liver disease, which would be a reason why we might think about transplant. The most common reasons that create barriers for somebody to receive a liver transplant are usually due to other underlying medical problems, which makes surgery difficult and they, or they might shorten the life, they might shorten the life of somebody who doesn't, even if they didn't have liver disease. So examples of this would be somebody who has liver failure, but they also have a heart or lungs that are not working properly or their kidneys. Sometimes certain infections make liver transplant risky. If somebody has an underlying cancer that isn't hepatocellular carcinoma, that liver transplant might not be the best option. And finally, we know that people's nutritional status or how strong or frail they are can really impact their recovery after transplant. And um, that is assessed um, uh, every time um, we're thinking about transplant. There's also psychosocial considerations, so individuals' um, ability to travel to medical appointments or be available for transplant, 
And finally, there's an assessment of individuals underlying history of alcohol use. And with that, I am going to hand it back over to Nem so he is able to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Lynch. Thank you, uh, Dr. Fodding, for that uh, great overview of alcohol associated um, liver disease. Uh, definitely going to have some questions uh, towards the end as uh, people have had generally some interesting um, inquiries and questions the last several years with respect to the pandemic and some of the, raise, or the rising numbers of cases. So we kind of just shift it over now uh, to welcome our next speaker, uh, which is Dr. Jose Lynch. Dr. Lynch received her medical degree from McGill University and completed a residency training in psychiatry at the University of Toronto. She graduated from the Yale University Addiction Psychiatry Fellowship in 2016 and has since maintained an affiliation as a visiting lecturer with the Yale University Department of Psychiatry. She works as a staff psychiatrist at the University Health Network in Toronto, where she provides clinical care in the addiction program and the multi-organ transplant program. Dr. Lynch, um, over to you. Thank you so much, Nam, for the introduction and also for the opportunity to speak about this very important topic. And thanks to everyone who's joining us tonight and choosing to spend their evening with us. So I am uh, hoping to pick up where Dr. Fleming left off and to walk you through the journey of what it looks like when patients with alcohol-associated liver disease are referred for transplant. So full disclosure, and as Nem mentioned, I am not a liver doctor. I do not have expertise as a hepatologist. I'm an addiction psychiatrist. But for the past six years, I've been working with the liver transplant program at Toronto General Hospital to develop a specialized program for this patient group. And that's what I would like to speak with you about this evening to let you know what types of supports are available, what the considerations are when somebody's being assessed for transplant, and then hopefully um, answer your questions about this. So what I hope you take away from the second half is understanding the process of liver transplantations for patients with alcohol-associated liver disease, to understand the importance of identifying and treating alcohol use disorder in this patient group, and I'll spend some time defining what that is, and then finally, to know what available resources are, are, are there for people with alcohol use disorder. So before I get started, though, I use a few abbreviations in my presentation, and I wanted to clearly define what they are because it can get confusing. The, the two that I use most have both happen to start with an A and have three letters. So ALD will be used to reference alcohol-associated liver disease. AUD is alcohol use disorder. And furthermore, I wanted to explicitly, um, you know, talk about the importance of language when we're talking about these types of conditions. I think, unfortunately, there's a tremendous amount of stigma and judgment uh, revolving around, you know, when individuals who struggle with substance use either you know, alcohol or other substances. And it's important to be careful about the terminology we use to not further that stigma. And I find that words like alcoholic, addict, they impose these labels that um, can cause judgment. So I, I'm avoiding these words and I wanted to say that explicitly at the beginning that I'll be using less stigmatizing language such as person with alcohol use disorder, person with substance use disorder. And I also don't like the term clean. Sometimes when people talk about people who are in abstinence from alcohol or clean, not a good word because it implies that those who are not are dirty. So clearly not the case. And so instead we use person in recovery or in remission. So alcohol associated liver disease has become the number one reason why people are referred for liver transplant consideration. It's something that is very common in this context. And many of you will be aware or uh, will have knowledge of the six month rule. So until recently, Canadian patients with ALD were uh, required to have stopped drinking for a period of six months prior to even being considered for liver transplantation. So there are a few reasons why that was. Um, firstly, excuse me, one of the expectations for people to 
access liver transplants is that they stop consuming alcohol because of the importance of alcohol abstinence in um, liver recovery. And also post-transplant, the transplanted liver is a lot more vulnerable than the native liver. So people who resume drinking post-transplant can have a return of liver disease fairly quickly. And because, you know, unfortunately there aren't enough liver, uh, deceased liver organs to a soup for everyone who needs them, many Canadians unfortunately pass away while waiting for a transplant on the liver transplant list. So there's, there's a responsibility to allocate organs in a way that maximizes good. So the liver, the, the six month rule was meant to address this, to be able to select individuals who were able to stop consuming alcohol. And as Dr. Fleming mentioned as well, for people who are able to stop drinking, a, a fair proportion of them will experience improvement in their liver function to the point where they no longer require transplant. So despite these reasons, there are lots of problems with the six month rule. The biggest one was the, the high mortality rate. So many people did not have six months to wait and the people would pass away before they reached that timeline. And if you look at the science behind it, uh, it the six month rule alone did not do great at predicting who would do well after transplant from an alcohol standpoint. So there is a need for something better, something more comprehensive to help guide the process. So that was what drove the development of the ALD program, which is the program that I'll speak to you about. And this is a provincial program, it's Ontario specific. Um, and I understand that many different provinces are looking into their own protocols, their own program currently. And there's also a national effort to have standardized guidelines for liver transplantation for ALD. But speaking specifically to Ontario, um, we developed a specialized program specific to the ALD population. And it's a multidisciplinary team that includes not only transplant liver doctors, but also addiction psychiatrists, addiction therapists, social workers, and nurses. So it's a variety of different perspectives of individuals with different expertise to help support, assess, and support patients. And this is the key piece here is that there's addiction support embedded within the liver transplant program with regular follow-up and access to care post-transplant. So instead of saying, you know, quit drinking, good luck, we have uh, we developed a program where the help to help for individuals to achieve this is um, in a one-stop shop type of model where they meet with the addiction psychiatrist or addiction therapist at the same place in the same program as they meet with their liver transplant doctors. So there are three core components of the program. So there's the assessment piece when people are referred for transplant consideration. So determining, you know, transplant suitability and what types of supports need to be put in place to, for, for patients. And that's the treatment piece. And that's related to the alcohol, um, you know, helping people achieve abstinence and maintain it. And then also an important component is monitoring. So what happens after transplant to make sure that people continue to do well? So starting with the assessment piece, it used to be that uh, if somebody had consumed alcohol in the six months preceding um, the, the referral, they were assumed to be high risk. So we did away with that um, often false assumption and replaced it with a more comprehensive evaluation of all of the different factors that are associated with how well people do in terms of their ability to achieve abstinence from alcohol and to maintain it. So in mental health, when we think about, you know, better understanding people and better understanding what we can do to help them, we classify these things in three broad categories. So the biological factors. So that's, you know, talking about diagnosed illnesses, things like alcohol use disorder, or if there's a comorbid mental illness the family history, the genetics of AUP. We think about the psychological aspects of, you know, what is the person's coping style? Is alcohol their main coping mechanism? Are they able to develop other coping skills? What is their degree of insight into um, the problematic nature of their alcohol use? 
or the presence of an alcohol use disorder? And what about their ability and willingness to engage in treatment and support for alcohol use disorder? And thirdly, it's the social piece. What kind of um, home environment does the person reside in? Do they have social supports? Um, is there a lot of alcohol present in their household? You know, sometimes we're referred patients that are part of a couple where the, the, their partner consumes the same amount or even more alcohol than them and are not willing to change that. So that becomes an obstacle to help them navigate. So all of these different factors are assessed and they're assessed from the lens of the hepatologist, the psychiatrist, and the social worker. And then our team comes together, and for everyone that we meet, we discuss as a team what our uh, impressions are in terms of whether they're, they're ready to move ahead for transplant uh, medical evaluation, or if certain things need to be put in place to reduce the risk of them returning to problematic alcohol use post-transplant. It's a very collaborative, multidisciplinary model. So I speak a lot about alcohol use disorder and I wanted to define it a little bit more because it's not always obvious and there's lots of misunderstandings out there. So when somebody has an alcohol use disorder, it's not just drinking a lot of alcohol. It has nothing to do with the quantity consumed. It is a chronic relapsing, but treatable biopsychosocial disorder of the brain. And the way that we diagnose it is by speaking to individuals and assessing for four main uh, features. And you know, these are usually behavioral manifestation of how they're impacted by their alcohol use. So the first cluster of criteria that we look at is whether there's a loss of control over drinking. Um, for example, somebody sets the goal to cut down or to stop and they're able to do it for a period of time, but then something happens that they have a drink here, a drink there, and before long, it re-escalates the previous heavier amounts. Or someone who's just not even able to cut down or in the first place. Another feature is uh, ongoing alcohol use despite negative consequences. And those negative consequences can take many forms, for example, financial consequences, um, relationship consequences, breakdown of relationships, lots of conflict. Some people start to struggle at work uh, and also health consequences is something we often see in this context. You know, the inability to stop drinking alcohol despite a diagnosis of cirrhosis and an understanding that it's caused by alcohol. Also physical dependence is another thing that can happen. So when somebody has been exposed to alcohol daily for a lengthy period of time, the body comes to need it to be uh, in homeostasis and balance. So if alcohol is taken away and people stop suddenly, they can experience physical manifestations of alcohol withdrawal. It can range anywhere from anxiety and restlessness all the way to things like seizures and hallucinations. And then finally, cravings and associating alcohol with lots of different things, like, for example, the end of a workday, vacation, and then thinking very strongly about alcohol when one is in those situations. So those are, you know, there's in total when we assess, there's 11 criteria, but they all, they're easier to classify in these main subheadings. You don't need to meet all of these criteria to have an alcohol use disorder. An alcohol use disorder can range from mild to severe, depending on how many criteria are met. But once somebody has crossed the line into an alcohol use disorder, especially if it's moderate to severe, there comes a great role to engaging in treatment for it. Um, and I'll speak a little bit more about what that can look like. And, you know, sometimes people think, oh, I'll just stop drinking or family members just say, just stop drinking, you have liver disease. But I think it's important to understand that it's not that simple and, you know, to underline the importance of support and treatment, because there is a very strong biological aspect to alcohol use disorder that makes it very hard to stop drinking. And we now understand that, that there's changes that happen at the brain level that get in the way of people just stopping. And these changes take many forms. Uh, firstly, alcohol is very good at tapping into the reward system of the brain. So humans have an innate reward pathway that gets activated whenever we engage in behaviors that promote our survival. So things like looking for food, eating, companionship, 
sex. This pathway is there to ensure survival of the species. Alcohol is sneaky in that it taps into that and it makes alcohol very rewarding and very hard to resist. And people with AUD have an increased sensitivity to that kind of reward responsiveness to alcohol. The reward pathway gets activated just when people think about alcohol. They don't even have to drink it and it lights up. Secondly, um, when something uh, addictive like alcohol is often associated with, you know, parts of somebody's routine, it becomes associated with it. And what happens is that it becomes hard to do those activities without thinking intensely about alcohol. So there's a saying in neurology saying that, you know, cells that fire together, wire together, you know, they, they, there becomes an association between the activities uh, usually related to alcohol and alcohol. So that if you do the activity alone, you think very strongly about alcohol automatically. So that adds another layer to what makes it hard to just stop drinking. And finally, um, the part of the brain, um, there's a part of the brain called the prefrontal cortex that is responsible for decision making, reasoning, impulse control. And the setting of an alcohol use disorder, that part of the brain gets turned down and weakened. So all of a sudden, you know, the decision balance of should I have that drink or shouldn't I have this drink, the I will have that drink becomes louder and louder. And that's why when somebody has crossed the line into an alcohol use disorder, because of the brain changes, it becomes very difficult to just stop drinking without treatment, without having support to build the skills needed to work against those changes. And these are changes at the brain level. They have everything to do with alcohol. It's alcohol's fault. It doesn't mean that somebody is weak-willed or not strong. It's, that's what addictive substances do. And just very quickly, there's, it's important to note that there's a lot of social drivers of alcohol. We live in a very alcohol forward society. It's very heavily marketed. It has excellent PR. And in working with hundreds of people who have to stop drinking alcohol for their health, I become acutely aware of how it's in TV shows, movies, advertisements, it's associated with you know, celebrations with uh, milestones, it, it's, it's very hard to avoid. So all of this creates a perfect storm that makes it very challenging to just stop drinking. So I wanted to show some numbers just to kind of get a sense of what the alcohol use patterns are amongst Canadian. It's a bit old data from 2015. Um, alcohol use disorder is not that uncommon. Um, here, in any given year, 3% of Canadians will meet criteria for it, and that's just for that year, and that it doesn't include people who've had it in the past and are now in remission, for example, and the lifetime alcohol use disorder prevalence is about 18%. So other important points about ALD and AUD. Not everyone who has ALD, alcohol-associated liver disease, has an alcohol use disorder. There are some people that de develop liver disease because they drink alcohol heavily, but they have not lost control of their drinking. The liver disease is the first negative consequence. They're able to stop as soon as they're diagnosed. So they don't have an AUD. And those individuals have an easier go of stopping drinking because there hasn't been those brain changes developed. And also a liver transplant cures the liver disease, but it does not cure the alcohol use disorder. So there's still um, a very, especially for someone with a moderate to severe alcohol use disorder, treatment of it is very important in terms of the long game, making sure that people get as many healthy years as possible after a, living, uh, a liver transplant. So what can we do to help those who are at higher risk of returning to alcohol use after transplant. And that's the second part of the ALD program is the treatment piece. There's lots of different treatments for alcohol use disorder. I don't have time to go into all of them, but just to give you a sense that they address this, those same three kind of categories I spoke about, the biological, the psychological, and the social piece. And these are all things that we try and keep in mind when we meet people in the liver transplant program and figure out how we can best support people moving forward. 
One of the core elements of the program is relapse prevention therapy, which is a type of therapy that is skills-based and it teaches people to minimize the risk of returning to alcohol use. So it's, it's, um, it's very focused. And there's a phrase, recognize, avoid, cope, that I find sums it up well. So people learn to recognize what's, how alcohol wove itself into their own life stories, what it's associated with for them, learn how to know what the high risk situations and the triggers are, and when they can avoid them. And for the things that they can't avoid, learn skills to cope with them differently. So this is a very kind of individualized, specific treatment approach that teaches people to, the skills to navigate life without alcohol. Examples of topics, as I mentioned, identifying high risk situations, managing mood, anxiety, things that can sometimes uh, make people crave alcohol more. Drink refusal skills. Who do you tell about your liver disease and your decision to stop drinking? How do you tell people? How do you protect yourself from this massive influx of alcohol promotion in society? This can be done individually or in group based. And it's rooted in CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy. And it's very structured, time limited, and problem focused. And often when I mention treatment to, to patients, they're worried that I'm sending them in a dark church basement to an AA meeting where they have to speak in front of a crowd and reveal all their secrets. This is not that. This is really a, a problem focused therapy to teach people skills to do well as they shift toward the life without alcohol. There's also medications that can help. Uh, the medications can help both with the withdrawal phase, so when people develop withdrawal symptoms, as well as longer term um, cravings. Um, and there are many options that are safe in the setting of liver disease that can be used, especially in the early phase of stopping alcohol use. And medications, they're helpful, but they really work best when used together with counseling, because it's really kind of the environment Envir environmental changes, the behavior changes that drive the new routines and that uh, help people avoid difficulties. So lastly, uh, I'll wrap up to speak about the monitoring piece of the ALD program. What happens after transplant? Because as I mentioned, we have the long game in mind, right? And because as I mentioned, the alcohol use disorder can be as a chronic illness people can be vulnerable to relapse, you know, when they leave, they, they deal with hardship, when life throws them curveballs, it becomes harder not to fall back on old habits. So what can be put in place to help when that happens? So everyone that I assess pre-transplant who moves ahead and gets a transplant, I check in automatically, uh, whether they're doing well or not within a month of their discharge from hospital. And then together we decide what's a good appointment frequency in terms of checking in. And I like to check in fairly regularly, especially in the first year after transplant. Also screening for mental health symptoms for things that are associated with increased risk of return to, to drinking. And we also have alcohol testing with the regular blood work. And this is something that's done in an open way and transparent way. And sometimes because of stigma, because of shame, it's hard for people to share when they're struggling. And this adds another layer of us checking in to see how people are doing. Because the earlier we know if there's a bump in the road, the faster we can rally supports and get people reconnected to treatment or intensify treatment to help things get back on track. So I wanted to mention a couple of resources uh, for anyone who's interested in accessing treatment for alcohol use disorder. There is, uh, at least in Ontario, and I think different provinces are building similar models or have similar models. There's uh, low barrier clinics where people can drop in to speak with a nurse and a physician or one or the other to discuss available treatments for, for substance use disorders. In Ontario, we have, uh, they're called RAM clinics. Um, and also in case there's family members um, in the audience, sometimes it's hard to talk about these things with your loved ones. And this is a book that I recommend often for families that I work with as a way of communication with individuals who might not be ready to change their drinking patterns um, in a way that is, and how, how to communicate with them in a way that is um, evidence-based, more supportive and has been shown to have better results.
And then finally, I just want to acknowledge the large ALD team at Toronto General Hospital because it really took a village to get this program up and running. Um, and it, it is a privilege to work with all of them. So that is the end of my presentation. Um, I welcome your questions and comments and thanks again for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Lynch for that uh, great overview. Um, very insightful for those folks who have been tuning in to get a different approach from uh, kind of a psychosocial approach, the kind of services we or are available uh, to, to residents and folks of whether it's the city or the hospital or even just generally across the country. Um, a few questions kind of popped up in some of the comments feed and some of the questions that we've received, uh, not only at the foundation, but also from general inquiries. Um, I suppose uh, both of you can maybe perhaps comment on this one. It's if you've noticed an increase in uh, specific alcohol associated liver disease um, over the last several years, um, either prior to the pandemic or during the pandemic. And if so, uh, would you potentially able to highlight some causes or reasons for this increase? Um, and if it's been recognized across the country or if it's just province specific? Um, and additionally to that, if it resulted in more transplants um, kind of over the last several years. So again, general increase, has it been an increase in alcohol related liver disease over the last few years? And um, perhaps highlighting some causes or reasons and if it has resulted in more transplants um, to the program or just generally from understanding in the country. So perhaps uh, Dr. Fleming, you can go first and then Dr. Lynch, you can uh, perhaps comment on it as well. Sure. Uh, thanks, Nem. So that's a really good question. And the answer is um, yes to all of that. So um, it, so my research group has looked at least in Ontario and we looked over the past 20 years and we looked at the number of individuals who were diagnosed with alcohol associated cirrhosis. And we showed over that period of time that steadily that number has been increasing and it's been most significantly increasing in younger individuals. So people born actually um, after 1965 with the highest increase seen in individuals who were born after 1980. So certainly that there had been a trend um, before COVID that this was already happening. And then we know since COVID, one of the uh, effects of the pandemic has been that people have been resorting to using more alcohol. And if you look um, across Canada, there's multiple studies that have shown that alcohol sales after the pandemic have increased uh, quite significantly. And we have also seen from the clinical side, so working in the hospitals and working in the clinic, we're seeing many, many, many more patients who are coming in with much more severe alcohol associated uh, liver disease injury from alcohol use. So this is happening um, and it's been documented. And I think the reasons for it are not obviously clear. Some of the things that Dr. Lynch mentioned certainly are contributing such as promotion of alcohol, increased alcohol sales, targeted marketing, um, as well as making access to alcohol easier by putting it in grocery stores, early uh, hours to the grocery stores, um, all of those things together, I think, have created kind of this perfect storm where alcohol-associated liver disease is becoming much, much more common. And we predict that this is just going to continue to get uh, worse um, as time goes on, unless something changes in the way that um, we're dealing with alcohol use from a, from a population level. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Lynch, anything to add on your end? Yeah, no, I echo that. I think, you know, anecdotally in the narratives that I've been hearing from patients, it seems that the start of the pandemic was a turning point for many people in terms of their alcohol use. And I think the lack of structure seems to contribute quite a bit, whereas somebody might only be consuming alcohol in the evening when they're working, they're leaving the home to go to work. All of a sudden they were at home all day. So many people share that they started drinking earlier and earlier in the day and then would cross the line into that AUD diagnosis because of that constant exposure to alcohol. That probably, you know, I'm speculating, this is not anchored in research data, but I'm speculating like we would not have happened um, otherwise. 
Um, I think there's been also an increase in depression, anxiety throughout the pandemic, and those are also two risk factors for increased alcohol use and development of alcohol use disorder. Um, we have certainly been um, busier than ever in our program since uh, 2020, and those numbers unfortunately continue to arise. Thank you for that. Uh, perhaps maybe anchoring to that question, um, Dr. Funding, I know uh, for the audience members, you've done uh, quite a bit of research in the um, field for, for women, uh, particularly young women uh, being affected uh, by uh, whether or getting a diagnosed with cirrhosis, um, alcohol based or and or non alcohol uh, based as well. Um, would you be able to maybe comment as just kind of the, some of the findings as to why that specific number amongst younger females has been increasing and uh, why it's becoming so concerning and uh, perhaps if it's been something that's been going on for the last maybe decade or have the numbers uh, just skyrocketed over the last few years. Um, and I know you mentioned kind of that sex and gender is a factor, of course, that affects liver damage from alcohol and perhaps some of the maybe the physiological reasons for why women are more prone to more extensive liver damage um, when compared to men, for instance, if they're consuming even a small amount of, of alcohol throughout their day or throughout their week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are those are all great questions. So when we looked at the number of individuals with developing alcohol associated cirrhosis over the past 20 years in Ontario, it's steadily been increasing over time. Um, we haven't looked yet since COVID, but my assumption is, and there's been studies, you know, in the United States and other parts of the world where it sharply is increasing um, after COVID, specifically for um, acute alcoholic hepatitis. So that form of very severe liver injury that's like the car crash where you can have a normal liver and then all of a sudden you develop liver failure. That's been becoming much, much more common and especially among young women. And I think there's, there's biologic as well as cultural factors that are leading to that. So the first thing is, is that when your body metabolizes alcohol, it's absorbed through the stomach. And so one of the key enzymes that you need to break down alcohol is called alcohol dehydrogenase, and that's made in the stomach, but the levels of that enzyme are 30% less among women. So for any given level of alcohol, women are unable to metabolize it in the same way that men are. The second thing is, is that the distribution of alcohol in your body is based on the amount of total body water. And because of uh, women are generally smaller and usually have less muscle mass and therefore they have less body water. And so that the concentrations of alcohol can get higher because you have less uh, body water. Um, the liver is also responsive to sex hormones, specifically estrogen. And so we don't really understand it, but we, there's, there's some thinking that there's probably some influence from these sex hormones that maybe are predisposing women. And then there's all the, the social cultural factors that have evolved over time. So historically, let's say, you know, 40 or 50 years ago, women did not consume alcohol in the same way that men did. But what's happened over time is that there was this gap between, you know, men and women and who consumed alcohol. And now all of a sudden that gap is closed. And so men and women are drinking alcohol at similar um, rates, but because women are more susceptible because of the things that I mentioned before, they're probably developing uh, more alcohol associated liver disease. And then all the other things of targeting alcohol to women, the mummy wine culture, the, you know, uh, going out and having drinks with your friends and all the, the TV shows and everything which are, are really promoting that. So I think that there's this, just this perfect storm that has um, happened over the past several decades where women are being disproportionately affected uh, for alcohol-associated liver disease. Dr. Lynch, anything to add uh, from here? And I'm sure, of course, crosses over and applies uh, to perhaps your practice or what you've seen as well. Yeah, I don't have the numbers in terms of our, our transplant program and referral, but one thing that it is notable is that women tend to present younger um, for liver transplantation because you really get that telescope of the adverse health outcomes secondary to alcohol. You know, whereas a man might need to drink 30 years to get this degree of liver disease, a woman needs to drink for far fewer years. 
So the patients we do see who are women tend to be younger on average. So that's one of the differences that, that are notable in our patient population. Perfect, thank you. Um, perhaps this question, uh, maybe for you, Dr. Lynch, uh, I know you've highlighted some kind of programs, some great services the program uh, just recently started to offer. Uh, would this be something that caregivers or family members would also have access to or perhaps would be applicable to them? Sorry, do you mind? I didn't quite get the, so the, the services within the ALD program? Yes, yes, yeah. So all the services you're mentioning, um, would I know with individual patients, of course, being um, kind of yeah. primary target would perhaps die members or caregivers since they are involved, um, like you mentioned, their journey, would that be something that's applicable to them or would they have to go through perhaps a different pathway or, um, or how would they be involved perhaps? So in, in terms of how we more involve family members, so I always love it when family members participate in the appointments and are present because it's an opportunity to talk together about some of the things they can do together to support the person in stopping alcohol use. So often they, they come to their initial appointment and then the follow-up appointments as well. Um, so absolutely within our program, we do so. When the caregiver has also struggles with alcohol, unfortunately, because we're a limited resource, we're not able to, um, to treat everyone, but we have an addiction therapist with our team that has become expert at knowing all the resources in Ontario, and she can certainly help liaise them to appropriate local programs and services. That's great, thank you. Um, and one of the questions here, uh, I, I suppose following transplants uh, with respect to follow-up, um, is this something that the healthcare team is um, involved um, following transplant as well, or is there a different kind of process uh, when somebody has completed their uh, transplant journey? Just from the folks who've uh, received the transplant and are either two or five years following, um, if uh, some of these um, follow-ups with healthcare providers are still continuous, um, some for, so they don't feel like they're being um, forgotten about or, or let go, uh, perhaps maybe what you guys mentioned, just the general kind of follow-up process with the post stops. Absolutely. So the, the follow-up tends to be more intense in the first year post-transplant, but I tell people that they're stuck with me for life and that if there's ever any bumps down the road, they're always welcome to come back. And um, it depends. It's a, it's a joint decision process. You know, often patients don't feel the need to come back to see me when things are going really well, when they've had a year, of, you know, not drinking, they're back and they have new routines, they don't feel cravings. Um, so at that point, we can, we usually say, you know, we'll, we'll end the regular follow up for now, but please check in if anything changes in the future. I'll just have one last question here. Uh with respect to medications or emerging pharmacotherapies um, as they relate to alcohol related liver disease. Um, is there anything that um, is currently being used or perhaps an emerging therapy that uh, maybe both of you can mention or perhaps just uh, highlight uh, in terms of how it perhaps works and whether it's something that advanced liver disease patients um, would benefit from and how would they benefit from? So just pharmacotherapies that are available or any kind of emerging uh, medications. Uh, maybe Dr. Fleming can go first and then we can finish with Dr. Lynch. Yeah, that's a great question. And, and unfortunately, despite the high burden of alcohol-associated liver disease, we have very few treatments um, for it. And I think one is because it's a complex condition. The second is that we just haven't designed the proper studies uh, for that. But because of the recognition that alcohol-associated liver disease is becoming uh, such a widespread problem, there's multiple groups across the world who are looking into new ways in order to treat alcohol associated liver disease. Now, a lot of it has to do with um, treating alcohol use disorder um, because abstinence is, is kind of the cornerstone of management of alcohol associated liver disease. Um, and then there's other um, uh, studies that are looking at how can we decrease the inflammation in the liver and how can we get rid of the scarring and, and things like that. So I think I, I'm really hopeful over the next five to 10 years that there's going to be some new therapies that are uh, coming through to um, help patients. But it, it's really unfortunate that we don't have a, we don't have a lot in our toolbox right now. We need to, to fill it up. 
Dr. Lynch? Again, I'm not a hepatologist, so I can't speak about the treatments for the liver disease, but in terms of the alcohol use disorder, I also wish we had a more fulsome toolbox. We tend to use the general medications used for alcohol use disorder for this patient population, but we select the ones that are not toxic to the liver. There's a few options that are eliminated by the kidneys and that bypass the liver, so those tend to be favored. There are a few options there, um, but I do wish that we had better treatments uh, overall. Great, thank you. Okay, well that, uh, that was the last question, last answer for today, uh, for tonight, and uh, that concludes the webinar for this evening. So I want to take the time to thank Dr. Fleming, Dr. Lynch for their great presentations and great talk, and thank the UH and Engineer Transplant Center and the Center for Living Organ Donation for helping with this webinar today. Uh, so as mentioned, this will be available uh, on both the Canadian Liver Foundation and the University Health Network website, Facebook page, and YouTube channel the next few days. So if you weren't able to catch the full presentations, rest assured, it will be available on our channels. So to learn more about liver disease or to find out more about the CLF, you can visit liver.ca. And of course, to get more information on transplantation and living organ donation, you can visit the uhntransplant.ca website. So I want to thank you all for attending. Until next time, and stay.